just can we go back to reductionism? Mm. The, you, you said you felt that those we'd come to the end of that particular kind of mm. science. What did you? I wouldn't say that. No, I no, don't what, think. You, okay. you, you, I th so but reduction this, but this is a danger. Reductionism, at least. Well, right. So, so just reductionism has been physics' best friend, right? In the sense that it's been so useful as a way of making sense of what's going on because what it does is if you have something very complicated, you break it into little bits, study the little bits, put things back together again, and hope that the, the, the toll is the sum of its parts. Yeah. And the ultimate goal of reductionism, of course, is to reduce everything to the simplest possible components. So this notion goes all the way back to atomism, the old notion of atomism from Greece, where matter is made of little things, and hence you just have to put them back together again like Legos, you know, like yeah. little Lego yeah. blocks, right? Reductionism is this it, idea that you can break into the parts, but the whole is nothing more than the sum of the parts. Exactly, right? So, and that's, it's true for many systems, right? But it gets harder when the systems are not so well behaved and they have many, many interacting parts. But there is a place for reductionism in science, obviously, you know, and I mean, the fact that every atom of hydrogen is the same around the universe is a triumph of reductionism, which is true. They are the same, you know. So there is this fundamental repetition, you know, of these basic building blocks. And that's why um, it's been so tantalizing to extend this notion to everything that is, right? So people have tried to do mechanistic models of pretty much the mind and the weather and life, life and even, even, even economics, right? And, and those things just don't do very well. Yeah. And, then the, and they don't do very well because those, those are things that you try more emergent in some way or the other. They don't do very well because sometimes, depending on the complexity of the system, so if you have a system that has many parts that interact with one another, in what we call non-linear ways. So a non-linear interaction is, you know, if you kick a rock, it kicks you back in the same way, right? And um, in a non-linear world, right, in non-linear forces, a small stimulus can create a huge effect, right, and vice versa. So it becomes much harder to predict the behavior of, of a system which has many parts doing that at the same time. The thing about reductionism is that it tries to make the universe into a big machine, like yes. clockwork. Yeah. And that is an idea which is a very old idea, you know, from the 18th century, 19th century, where if everything is mechanistic, so, you know, there's this big engine behind everything, then everything is explainable and everything is predictable. This is the ultimate determinism. Yeah. And the consequence of this is that if everything is predictable, so is behavior. So is what I'm going to say now. And that makes us a prisoner of this machine. And that tells you that you're really not a free person, that there is no such thing as free will. Mm -hmm. And that's why the romantics were so pissed off at the scientists, you know, because they were saying, hey, it's all a big machine. And they would say, wait, wait a second, what about love and feelings and confusion and doubt? Where does that all fit into this new science you guys are talking about? That's not the whole picture. It cannot be the whole picture, right? And that is where reductionism starts to flounder, right? Because basically it's trying to do much more than it can, which is to predict the future in a way which is 100% accurate. And we know now that that's not possible. And is that dangerous for science, do you think? It is dangerous for science because whenever science says that it can understand everything, including who you are and who you're going to be and how you're going to grow up, it's robbing people of themselves. It's basically taking, killing their, their persona, in a sense, and saying, you really are just a mountain of atoms, you know, and I, I know if I know how to crank this, this machine, I'm just going to tell you who you are, right? And that just makes you dumb, right? Yeah. It makes you into an automaton, yeah. and nobody wants to be an automaton. It robs the world of meaning, doesn't it? It says there's just the machine. The little, someone's turning the little handle on the machine, and it doesn't well, mean Well, no anything. one's turning it. The machine is well, just, it's just, just turning going itself. Yeah, okay. The machine's just kind of ra rattling along. <laughs> yeah. You may think that you're doing something, but actually it's the machine that's yeah. rattling along, and so there is no self. There and does it no rob it of meaning? I mean, well, it does because um, because it basically tells you that there's no point in searching for anything because everything is already written. That there is no 
point in, in trying to understand who you are because who you are is really pointless. It's about electrons interacting, you know, in this big complicated way. And nobody likes that, right? I mean, you want to be able to be mysterious. People want mystery before they want reason and certainty. I think people need to not know, right? And but, but, but just to interject, some yes. people are saying, well, that may be the case that you want this, but, you know, I'm sorry for you. Yeah, grow up. Grow up. <laughs> yeah, grow up and face the cold, hard reality that we are nothing but a bag of chemicals. Well, we are definitely a, nothing but a bag of chemicals, but we have no clue how to predict how that bag of chemicals will behave. Okay. You know, I mean, so to, the, to say that reductionism fails doesn't mean that there is more to it than matter. It doesn't mean that there is some sort of soul or spirit okay. that is controlling stuff. It just means that science cannot do that job. You know, that, and I think that's a wonderful thing, that people ask way too much of science. Some scientists, you know, the, the ones that go push reductionism all the way to the end, they're asking science much more than, than, than science should be able to, to answer, which is to answer everything. You know, science was not designed to give us all the answers. In fact, science thrives on ignorance. You know, it's, it's really, we, we need not to know in order to create new knowledge, right? Mm. And so this belief, because it's nothing more than yeah. a belief, really, yeah. you know, that science can probe into the behavior of everything and come up with final answers about who you are or even about what nature is, right, is really, I, I think, uh, a misunderstanding of what science is about and how science actually operates. I, I think the argument sometimes goes like this, well, we don't yet have a science of free will of, or who you are, but we will one day because we didn't used to have a science of gravity, but now we do. We didn't used to have a science of quantum mechanics, but now we do. And so one day we'll have a reductionist explanation of everything in Marcelo Gleiser based on the atoms in his right. body. And that to me is, is like a prayer. Okay. You're like praying, <laughs> okay. you know. To me, what's really important, right, is that we are creatures that look for meaning in everything that we do. We want to feel justified in our actions. And those scientists, you know, who are saying that there is an ultimate knowledge, that is their search for meaning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what makes their lives meaningful. You know, if there is one, anything that says, you know, uh, what is the meaning of life, right? Well, the meaning of life is to live a life full of meaning, right? <laughs> And, 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 and that's exactly what they are doing in their own way. So if they believe that you can understand everything, right, then that is the ultimate quest of the ra rational mind. And you dedicate your life to that. That is what gives them meaning, and that's awesome. Yeah. You know, good to them, right? And, and what I'm saying is that there are other ways in which you can find meaning in your life, right? To me, you know, the way I look at this right now is I look at, what we have learned about the universe, what we have learned about other planets outside of Earth, and what we have learned about how life evolved in this planet, and we know how rare Earth is, and how rare we are as a species, an intelligent species, you know, the, the, the yeah. sort of stardust that can actually think, yeah. right? And that brings us back, we humans, to the center of things, you know, not in a Copernican way that we are the center, you know, yeah. the, the antic, yeah. but, but in, the, in the, the fact that we are, like Carl Sagan said that before I did, you know, we are how the universe is thinking. And because of that, and I have my little crusade here, you know, we should be guardians of life and specifically of this planet. So to me, you know, this new science, instead of saying, oh, the universe is enormous, we are nothing, we're just machines, we have no free will. No, we are actually incredibly important because without us, you know, the universe wouldn't have any meaning because there would be no one to think about meaning in the universe.